Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're asking, how was language created? Like, how did our distant ancestors start speaking so that eventually everybody could have a podcast? (laughs) Yes, finally. The question of how language originated has boggled scientific minds for centuries. And we'll find out if the answer lies in a time travel adventure. Today's question comes from Tumble listener Eliana. Hi, my name is Eliana. I'm 12, and I was wondering how humans created language. Thank you. Love your podcast. That's really such a good question. And how could we possibly know? Because it's not like there are recordings of podcasts from like 500,000 BC. (laughs) (laughs) Rock. Rock is word. (laughs) Yeah, so I'd imagine it would take a long time for language to become as complex as it is today. So let's ask our listeners, how do you think that humans created language? And how would scientists find out? Think about it. Right, so what kind of scientists do you call to find out how humans created language? Is it like a create lango wallagus? <laughs> That's what it would be, right? <laughs> oh, you call a scientist who studies language a linguist. <laughs> yeah, I guess I knew that. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had one of those on the show before, though, which is a shame because studying languages is, like, really cool. Totally. But we have mentioned a linguist on the show before. Really? When did we do that? Well, just a few episodes back, our episode about Braille, which was called How Do We Read? Oh, that was a great episode. Everybody (laughs) should listen to that a couple of times. I agree. (laughs) So you might remember that we talked about a linguist who happens to be blind named Robert Engelbretson. He's an expert on Braille, but in general, he studies how language works. And he was up for trying to answer Eliana's question. Eliana's question is a really great question. And it's a question that that linguists have been asking for a long time, and not just linguists, but really anyone who's interested in in language and notice that there's so many of them. Yeah, like how did we go from having no language to having like a lot of them? (laughs) And languages that are so incredibly different that no one can learn them all. Yeah, and those differences between languages is the thing that fascinates Robert the most. Uh, To me, one of the most and one of the coolest things about being human is just this diversity of languages. The fact that currently, you know, in the 21st century, there are still 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. I mean, with 7,000 languages, there are at least 7,000 questions to ask. Like, how did Basque get started? <laughs> how did Chinese get started? That's two. <laughs> So Keep going. <laughs> this is a long episode. Yeah, I'm just going to list every language, and it's going to take four hours. <laughs> so that's before we even get to, like, how all of them, like, what was the first one? So where do you start? It's really overwhelming. Well, before we dig into the specifics, let's zoom out to the bigger picture of why we study language. Studying linguistics lets us understand part of what it means to be human in a big way. Yeah, I mean, that's a really big picture, what it means to be human. So what does Robert mean by that? Almost everything we do as human beings involves language in some form or other. I guess that's totally true. Like, how can we even think about what we do without having the language to think about it? Does it exist? (laughs) Does it exist if you can't say it? I think that's why Eliana's question feels so deep. How do you even think about what humans did before language? Because our native languages are something we learn without even trying. And you don't give it a second thought. You simply learn to talk. And how that works and why that happens is such an amazing part of being human. Meaning language is unique to humans? That's an interesting question. Because while animals and even plants can communicate with each other in all sorts of creative and amazing ways... Humans are the only species that can express ideas in the past and future. Well, you know the saying, the past is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. 
try coming up with a quote like that, lizards. <laughs> <laughs> Just sitting there looking cool on a rock. <laughs> they couldn't even try. <laughs> So how did we create language and then separate ourselves from lizards? Because that's really the only thing. <laughs> did you ask Robert? Obviously, I did. But Robert had his own question. How would you go about answering this question? Huh. I mean, this sounds suspiciously like the question we asked our listeners at the beginning. How would scientists find out? Which it seems like he should have a better answer than that. <laughs> It turns out this question is a big stumbling block for linguists to discover the origins of human language. In some areas of science, you can go out to the desert and dig up a fossil and analyze it. But human language isn't like that. You can't go up, you can't go up to the desert and dig up a word. <laughs> you might be able to find some old clay tablets or scrolls or things like that. Yeah, well, you can find tablets and scrolls, but that's not like a spoken language unless one of them is a tape recorder. <laughs> a tape recorder scroll? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. That is writing, and writing has only been around for about the past 5,000 years, whereas people have spoken languages for probably at least 100,000 years before that. Well, wow, 100,000 years is a long time, but... How do we know how long humans have been speaking for? That's another good question. The first languages likely came about when the human brain evolved for certain characteristics that allows for language. But we don't exactly know when that was because brains don't get fossilized either. So along with spoken language, it really sounds like there's lots of dead ends. People didn't have video recorders back then. And the only way to get at that would be to build a time machine, maybe one of your listeners might someday build a time machine, right, and go back and actually observe. Really? We need to build a time machine? That's what Robert said. So let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to plan our time machine adventure. We're back. So when we left off, we just found out that the only way to gather evidence about the creation of human language is to use a time machine, according to Robert. So I guess this episode is just over now because it's going to be a long time before one of our listeners builds one of those. And honestly, it's probably not possible. The episode's not over. Keep listening. Think of science fiction. I mean, even if the things we imagine don't come true... It's a way to think through the possibilities of finding an answer. And who knows, maybe we might discover something. I mean, I guess so, but is an actual scientist willing to go along with this crazy time travel plan? <laughs> That's what I asked Robert. Um, so are you up for a time travel adventure? Oh, I'd love to go into a time machine. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, then I guess it's time machine time. That's something I didn't think this episode would be about. Um, all right, so do we get like a big cardboard box and just draw a big dial? Is that what happens here? <laughs> Look, this is not some amateur cartoon operation. <laughs> We've got a legit time-traveling linguist to guide us. And he says we need to take the time to plan our study. This sounds like very secret and delicate research and we want to be able to do it right and do it in ways that doesn't accidentally change history and do it in ways that we can actually get to some of the answers that we're looking for without wasting a lot of i guess i don't know i was about to say without wasting a lot of time but i guess if you have a time machine you can't really waste time anymore <laughs> that is a good point and i share his concerns about changing history <laughs> <laughs> And I love hearing that we'll always have more time to waste because I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> this is true. Just imagine time machine would be such a boon for procrastinators everywhere. <laughs> Turns out you can do your homework later. <laughs> <laughs> well, focusing on our research, it's going to take a lot of time. This would be a huge project that would involve lots and lots of people and lots and lots of trips to the past. It wouldn't be the kind of thing where you could just turn a dial, go back in time once and realize, boom, that's when language happened. Because languages develop gradually over time. So it wouldn't be just like a one and done type of trip. No, because think about it. 
scientific studies take years to plan and do, and we're talking about actually observing thousands of years of human history. So we would want to go back to several different points in time. Let's, let's say maybe starting about 200,000 years ago. So why 200,000 years ago? Robert says that's far enough in the past that we're sure to see language develop and watch what came before. Let's start there and then go every thousand years. So we'll, we will take um, 200 hops in the time machine. So at every hop, we'd just check out if people are speaking and then figure out what their language is like. Well, where we hop is another thing to figure out. And in terms of where to go, that's also a really good, tricky question. I mean, gosh, if you've already built one time machine, maybe you can build a lot more and we could go to a lot of different places. Because one of the big questions here is, did language only develop once in humanity? Or did it develop in multiple different places at different times? Okay, so... We want to know, like, did language start at one time in one place, or was it like a bunch of places? Exactly. Scientists aren't sure, and will need lots of advice on where and when to find groups of ancient humans. So this is where team science can become really important. So we need to let other people in on our top secret research plans. I hope they have clearance. I don't think we could explore this question without uh, a couple of archaeologists, anthropologists on board who are experts in archaeology, human archaeology, human history, that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, I guess I can see how that type of knowledge would probably be useful. And I suppose I'm down with a group effort, like... We don't have the expertise to build the time machine. We'd need at least someone to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, we'll need some physicists and engineers, too. And Robert had some ideas about what the time machine would need to allow us to do our research. So I think the time machine would have to have some sort of cloaking device to make us invisible observers. Smart thinking. So we wouldn't want to change the course of history by allowing ancient humans to see us. We need to be hidden, like in a cardboard box painted with leaves on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're talking actual physical invisibility. And not being seen is the number one rule of time travel. Sure. But we'll also need some way to capture our observations. Oh, we need a good video and audio recorder for sure to, to be able to record what is happening. So what would the video capture? Aren't we just listening for sounds or words? Couldn't we just do audio? <laughs> audio is the best medium, but there might be nonverbal ways that humans communicated. Some scientists think that sign language might have existed before spoken language is kind of a precursor. So we might want to watch their hands or other body language. Exactly. So there would be a lot of footage to go through. And Robert would have his work cut out for him when we returned to the present. What would we do when we got back with all of these recordings? We would analyze them uh, as, uh, as I would as a field linguist by looking at the, uh, the things that people say and how they say it. So how would we analyze words or like whatever kind of language we find in ancient time? Well, Robert turns language into data breaking it down into sentences, words, and pronunciations to study the structure and grammar. From there, he could ask specific questions about how language evolved. But... But what? But there's something important that Robert won't be able to do in his time travel studies. This is tricky work because I wouldn't be able to ask the people any specific questions, right? They can't know that I'm there. That means we might not be able to record how language changes over time if people don't happen to say the same words or phrases during our hop to their time. So we could just end up with a bunch of language puzzle pieces and they don't really fit together so we can't compare them. So it would be impossible to put together an answer for Eliana. It doesn't make it impossible, it just makes it a lot harder. In some ways, it's like any type of science that studies the past. The science is only as good as the evidence you can find. After all, you can't ask a dinosaur bone in the museum what its friends were named. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out Stegosaurus was friends with Turin. I mean, it would be like dinosaur sociology. Just a field we can't do. <laughs>
Anyhow, it turns out a time machine isn't going to answer Eliana's question for us. In fact, it may bring us new challenges and new questions. Even if it was real, we may never know the full answer of how language started. And for Robert, that's okay. I think some people may find it really frustrating to realize that there are questions that we can't answer. But to me, that's, that's life. That um, is part of the mystery of life, the mystery of who we are, where we came from. Uh, and I, I guess that's maybe one of the reasons why I like science fiction. So what does he mean by that? I think it makes us think of potentials. It makes us think of possibilities. And some of those possibilities may actually turn out to be right. Maybe. I mean, we really did just come up with a plan for the first study of human language by Time Machine. (laughs) (laughs) We are pioneers, and maybe this episode will go down in science history. (laughs) If only we had a time machine to go to the future and find out. (laughs) (laughs) Until then, there are a lot more questions we can ask about language and time travel. Now that you've been on a time travel adventure with us, come up with a scientific question that you would want to study using a time machine. Then, figure out all the questions you'd have to ask before deciding where and when you'll travel to and how you would make your observations. Write a story about your science time travel adventure or draw a picture of it. Give it a creative title, too, and then send it to us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com because we'd love to read it. Thanks to Dr. Robert Engelbretson, Associate Professor of Linguistics at Rice University. And thanks to Eliana for submitting her great question. You can learn more about linguistics on the bonus interview episode on our Patreon at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast or on our Spotify subscriber feed. And we'll have more free resources about the study of language available on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. This material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation under grant number 2148711, engaging blind, visually impaired, and sighted students in STEM with storytelling through podcasts. Special thanks to the team who helped us with this episode, Dr. Peter Walters and Dr. Carrie Sapolo, and the rest of the team at Independent Science. Also thanks to Dr. Kelly Reidinger, Dr. Martin Storksteek, and Dr. Victoria Sellers at Oregon State University's STEM Research Center, and Dr. Timothy Spock at AUI. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this episode and designed the episode art. Peter Walters is our editorial consultant for this series. Elliot Hijaj is our production assistant, and Gary Calhoun-James engineered and mixed this episode. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Mm